when you're kind of told that the theme of a day is people power and, and um, you're asked to talk about volunteering, the question's really kind of where, where to start, because volunteers undertake just so many roles in charities. I, I defy you to work in a charity and not have had contact with them in some kind of way, shape or form. It's what our whole sector is based on, and that's why they're so important. Fundraising, welfare delivery, communications, campaigning, governance. Remember, all of our trustees are volunteers. It's the very founding block of all of our organisations and runs through the heart of the sector. Yet rarely does it take centre stage um, until today, that is, or at least for my 15 minutes. So bear with me. There are around 15 million people in the UK uh, that volunteer um, once a month at least, and the Office for National Statistics values that economic worth at around £23.9 billion. And that doesn't even measure or recognise the rising incidence of informal, infrequent or micro-volunteering. So we need to understand what motivates such a, a huge army of people to give their time, energy and skills for free. Time Bank's a national volunteering charity. When we started in 2000, we wanted to engage a whole new generation of people to volunteer, um, very much in the way that Comic Relief kind of changed the way that people donated money. Um, demonstrably, you're all far too young to remember as it's more than 25 years ago, but essentially it was an absolute game changer um, uh, in terms of the dynamic of giving and the ways in which fundraisers engage people today. Um, and in the last 15 years, Time Bank has inspired more than a quarter of a million people to volunteer. We recognise that the whole ethos of volunteering has changed. Today's volunteers aren't looking to marry you. Uh, they're not even looking for a long-term commitment. They simply want a date and to see where that might lead. They don't want to make a contribution. They want to make a difference. And they're not content with being managed. They want to be inspired. Like so many things in the world in which we live today, this new kind of breed of volunteers wants to give time when it's convenient for them and in a way that suits them. And sometimes because of their family or caring commitments, that means not even leaving the home, <laughs> but getting onto the computer when they have a spare moment to do something that they can class as volunteering. So when we were planning a, a mentoring project to support carers to cope with the emotional stresses and strains of caring, for example, we knew that many carers are juggling a whole host of responsibilities, bringing up children, holding down a job, caring for an older family member, um, all at the same time. They're what we call the, the sandwich generation. And frankly, they're just about holding things together. If they become overwhelmed, the whole care system breaks down at enormous cost to the family and to the state. So we wanted to be able to support carers in a way that they wanted, at times that suited them, whether that was three o'clock in the afternoon or at that moment of utter exasperation at three o'clock in the morning. So in addition to face-to-face -face mentoring, we introduced an online mentoring support. We found the ability to offload, to discuss problems and have a sympathetic listening ear and a huge, had a, a huge impact on carers' uh, mental health and well-being and that many carers enjoyed not only the flexibility but even the impersonality of such online support. And in this very kind of circular project, our volunteers had also been carers. Um, some of them still were. For those no longer caring, they had like a huge void in their life and a wealth of kind of experience as carers. And they were able to fill that void by sharing that knowledge and supporting another carer at a different stage in their own caring journey. Um, it was a way, by volunteering, of re-entering the wider world, of, of gently helping another person, gaining confidence, and sometimes returning to a social life or even returning to work. Giving online support enabled them to do so flexibly and in a space that was safe. For those still caring, it provided a flexible way of supporting someone else when they had the time to do so without leaving the person for whom they cared. And it's certainly something that we will look to expand for other groups in the future. There are challenges, of course, in engaging today's passionate and empowered volunteers. Time banks evolved over the last few years, and we've developed a model that we think really works. We run our own volunteer mentoring schemes, matching volunteers in one-to-one -one relationships to tackle a variety of quite uh, complex social issues young people um, leaving care or recovering from mental health issues, ex-servicemen and women who are struggling to adjust to civilian life, 
helping disengaged young people to apply for jobs or offering uh, English language training for residents who are cut off from British life because they can't speak the language. And we also support smaller charities which need help to build their business skills and encourage businesses to engage their staff in volunteering. So we're kind of halfway there. We offer meaningful, flexible, rewarding volunteering opportunities that can make a difference um, to the vulnerable people we support and to the lives of our volunteers. Um, one of our volunteer mentors told us that if somebody had been there for his family in the most difficult times, it would have made a big difference. I feel this is the most worthwhile and rewarding volunteering role that I could possibly be doing. But the other half of the equation is understanding that if you want to attract keep and benefit from volunteers, then you have to kind of look after them. Good management means that you know what motivates your volunteers. Volunteers know what their role is and how it fits in the organisation's core mission. They receive training and they receive support. Their contribution is recognised and they're involved in planning and developing the service and their ideas are welcomed and acted upon. Organisations with very solid structures clear lines of communication and good relationships will always attract and keep those good volunteers. Even if, that's not, if, even if that's not what they planned when they signed up, they become kind of like serial volunteers. Um, and volunteering is one of the very few things that you truly want to get people addicted to. Let me give you a very high profile example of volunteering. The Olympics uh, was fantastic and the games makers certainly raised the profile of volunteering. But do remember that that was proper high-end volunteer management, training, support, and a phenomenal amount of money was invested in the games makers. So be careful to manage expectations of your volunteers. Not all of us have the budget of LOCOG and you don't get a John Lewis service with little investment which is, let's face it, the reality of most of our budgets. The truth is, of course, that most sporting volunteering is running the local football team, refereeing or running training sessions. It's washing the kit, painting the changing rooms, making the half-time drinks and snacks, which is a tad less glamorous than the Olympics, and you don't get the little uniform in purple and red either. Um, the truth is, though, of course, all of our Olympic stars started life being supported by volunteers in exactly that way. So they wouldn't be there without volunteers in the first place. I honestly believe that volunteering is a thread throughout our society which is so often completely overlooked. You just have to dig down and you'll find a volunteer story and probably someone who doesn't consider themselves a volunteer. They just think they're just helping. One of the problems with volunteering is that many different terms and descriptions are used to describe it. I've just used one myself, games maker. Phrases like active citizenship, citizen service, civic engagement, voluntary work and community benefit work placement have led to confusion and a perception that volunteering can be a compulsory activity. We all need to be absolutely clear about what volunteering is. It involves spending time, unpaid, doing something that aims to benefit the environment or the community. It's freely given. It's not for financial gain, incentive or obligation. The principle of non-payment of volunteers is, I believe, central to society's understanding of volunteering. So, it's quite interesting to take um, the example of uh, the popularity and success of recent fundraising campaigns like the Ice Bucket Challenge. Huge success, raised millions of pounds for ALS in the US and uh, for its British equivalent, the motor neurone disease, um, along with Macmillan cancer here in the UK. Every charity wishes it could have a similar viral campaign. It was fun, and it shows the importance of changing our perceptions about how we engage people and maximise their charitable potential. Because the content being shared was all about the person posting it, not the organisation. People weren't being asked to spread the message about motor neurone disease. They were being asked to share a video about themselves. <coughs> Same with the no makeup selfie for Cancer Research UK. It offered people a chance to show off online in the name of a good cause with very little effort. And at the end of the day, who could refuse that? It's become all about the selfie, which is slightly depressing. Traditional volunteering, on the other hand, is rarely so sensational. Millions of people may be providing transport, visiting older people, or mentoring a young person living with a mental health issue, like some of our own projects. 
Their motivation is about the beneficiary, not themselves. And yes, we'd like them to spread the word about what they're doing to help inspire more volunteers, but these are people who are just quietly getting on with the job. Um, as we said in our election manifesto, please feel free to sign up to it, hashtag volunteering2015. Uh, volunteering is uh, consistently and systematically undervalued by organisations, policymakers, and wider society. Uh, we want the new government, whoever they are, to promote the value of volunteering and encourage a climate in which it flourishes. Indeed, the ultimate opportunity for people power is a general election. Elections are a showcase opportunity for volunteering. Um, they harness the power of volunteers to encourage others to vote. Without volunteers, MPs couldn't canvass on our doorsteps across the constituencies. Now, that may be not a good thing right now. You'll be a little bit bored of people knocking on your door. But um, at the end of the day, that's all volunteer-led. Political parties couldn't prepare or function without volunteers, nor could the actual vote happen. So truly, they are at the very heart of our democracy. Sadly, I suspect they will not be at the very heart of the story over the coming weeks. When it comes to volunteering, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's far too much of that happening with ill-thought-out initiatives like the big society, calling for more people to volunteer without acknowledging those that already do. What we do need is recognition that volunteering isn't free. Organisations invest substantial resources in volunteering, and this at a time when the voluntary sector is being called upon to do a great deal more with a great deal less. We want the government to recognise that dealing with problems at their source is better than picking up the pieces afterwards. We believe volunteering has a vital role to play in the early intervention agenda, for example, and that it's a proven and cost-effective way of tackling complex, complex social issues in our society, from the challenges of an ageing population to community integration. Partnerships made up of voluntary, statutory and private sector organisations can ensure that local services are better planned, coordinated and delivered and that they deliver better value for money. However, to be clear, that's partnerships. Not seeing the voluntary sector as the cheap option that pick up the soft bits of contracts uh, at, an, at an almost impossible to achieve payment by results basis. It's proper partnership. We need to actively encourage employers to support their staff into volunteering, both as an entry point to volunteering and a way as giving back to the communities in which their businesses are based. And finally, to really harness volunteer power, it's important to think out of the box. So at Time Bank, we give all our staff an additional five days volunteering leave um, over and above their holiday. And last year, one of my staff came and said, um, I'd like to um, volunteer to train a guide dog. Can, can we have it in the office, please? Um, so I said, yeah, all right. Um, have you, you know, the, the interesting thing about having that guide dog in our office is the things that it taught us. Taught us about diversity and accepting the unusual. It made us think about the importance of being willing to try something new, as well as the kind of various challenges that blind people have and the value that a dog can make to them. And somehow he's kind of changed us for the good as an organisation and just become part of the team that we, you know, we say good morning to. Uh, the difference being that he kind of rocks up and falls asleep under the, the, the desk, which isn't a really particularly good example to his colleagues. <laughs> but the point is that volunteering is all around us in, in, in just like a huge variety of forms. And without volunteers, many things throughout our society, not just our sector, simply wouldn't happen. And that's why all of us need to adapt to the reality of the new generation of volunteers and to just try and harness that phenomenal power. Thank you.